You guys ever heard about the, the volunteerism pyramid? And so they start you off with some really easy tasks and then they give you bigger and bigger ones. And I ended up right at the top <laughs> as the president. Uh, but I'm happy to be there. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's extremely challenging. And if we ever get this thing, I think it's going to make a, a real difference. One of the things that I've had to do over the years uh, in my work with Faribault Canada is, is to hone the presentation. When we started, we tended to focus on, so like, you know, going back three or four years, describe to people how proportional representation would work. And people get kind of bored or they get headaches because it can be pretty complicated to understand. So what I'm doing today is I'm testing a different way to tell the story. And it's way much more of a story than what you've seen before. I'm going to start by giving just a little historical perspective. And then we have two major sections. The first section is talking to you about what the issue is. And I think most people in this room probably have a pretty good idea. But you'll see how it's presented. And that you might find that it's presented a little differently than usual, and, and you may get some ideas out of that. Um, and then the second part is about the road to change. How do we get proportional representation? What are the challenges, and what are some of the ideas that we have for moving this, uh, this agenda forward? So first of all, just a couple of words about Faribault Canada. We've been around since the year 2000, so basically roughly 20 years, um, which is not long in the course of history. Uh, in the UK, the Electoral Reform Society has been around for over a hundred years. Um, and one could say, and they still don't have proportional representation? <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of scary, but they have it in Wales, they have it in Northern Ireland, uh, they have it in Scotland, and the EU elections are done using proportional representation. So every time they've had to introduce something new, they've introduced it as a proportional representation approach to things. Um, the trick is moving from the old to the new with regards to parliamentary elections. In the UK, they still haven't succeeded. I expect they will before very long. They may actually beat us. Uh, who knows? It's such a mess over there. Uh, they have more incentive to change than, uh, than maybe we do. It's wor a worse mess than, that, than what we have to suffer. Um, so we've been around since 20 years. We've had how many referendums? A half a dozen referendums since then. Some we won, but we lost anyway because the threshold was too high. Some we won, but we lost anyway because they said, well, the turnout wasn't high enough. They do everything they can to prevent change in this area. Um, and we're learning some lessons from that, and I'm going to talk about some of those lessons a little bit later on. Um, what I want to point out is that electoral reform isn't something new in Canada. We've had electoral reform forever, but the way it has looked in the past is mainly through the enlargement of the franchise. You know, at first it was male landowners. Those were the people who could vote. And that expanded to non-landowners, including working class. It then included women in the early 20th century. Well, not that long ago, 1916, I think, federally. Um, the uh, indigenous population got the vote. So it was the expansion of the franchise was one of the major things. Also, electoral finance. A number of things like that. So a lot's been happening. And you know, Canadian democracy is actually rated quite high. I think it's probably rated too high because people don't always appreciate how much of a problem our first-past-the-post uh, system is. But there's a lot of things that we do right. You know, an independent electoral, uh, uh, electoral officer, for example. Things like that. So it's been going, for, uh, going on for a long time. But, and there has been... Uh, Proportional representation has been actually implemented in some places, in particular in Manitoba and Alberta, but only in the cities. In Calgary and Winnipeg, between 1920 and 1950, they had a single transferable, transferable vote mechanism. So we've had it, uh, but that's, that's where the hardest change to get has been, is to get proportional representation in Canada. In Europe, very different story. In Europe, with the expansion of the franchise, there was a split in the political forces in the country as the socialist parties gained more and more power. Then you had your liberals and conservatives and one of them was more threatened than the other. And as you forged alliances between the emerging workers' parties and one of the more conventional parties, you got proportional representation virtually everywhere in Europe at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Which is why today, almost every European country, exceptions being the UK and France, has some form of proportional representation. That's the very short, tight story, uh, but it goes to show it can happen, it has happened before. Uh, New Zealand, of course, is another example where 
uh, first um, proportional representation was implemented, in that case following a referendum. So gradually, more and more of the world has shifted towards proportional representation. And I will give you a map later on that shows who still has first past the post uh, on the map so you get a sense of what that looks like. So let's skip directly now to my fourth slide. As I tell this story, people have been talking about framing. That when you talk about proportion, electoral systems, people have in their heads this sort of winner-loser approach to things. Elections like a hockey game. Who's going to win? Who's, that's all they talk about in the media, am I right? Who's going to win? That's what, that, that's what constitutes the discourse in our public media around an election. So what I want to do with this slide is get us thinking a little bit differently about how we frame what our democracy is about. Ultimately, democracy is about making collective decisions about problems that concern us all in a collective way. So we've got our private lives, we've got our collective lives, but our collective lives are extremely important. It covers a lot of things. I've got some of them out outlined here. The whole issue of climate change, managing the environment in general, daycare, healthcare, dental care, peace and security, sound economic policy. These are things we have to care about and that can only be resolved through politics. The question then is, what kind of politics do we want? And I would invite you to think about how you do democracy in your own personal lives. How you do democracy in your families. How you do democracy when you have a union meeting. How you do democracy with your friends when you're trying to decide which movie to go watch. Is it a winner-take-all kind of thing? No, it's not. What you're doing is you're sitting down with a group of people and you're trying to come up with the consensus that best meets everybody's objectives. And you might vote. You know, ultimately you've got some people want to see this movie, some people want to see the other, but you all want to go together. Well, let's vote after you've discussed it. You discuss it a lot first, right? And then if you have to, you vote. But it's not primarily about voting and it's definitely not about winners and losers. It's trying to make everybody a winner. Right? It's trying to, that's the kind of democracy that makes us feel good. And that's what we're looking for. And I would submit to you that proportional representation gives you that kind of democracy much more than first past the post. And that's the framing. We need to frame things in such a way that we get away from the winners and losers and we actually treat this winner-loser mentality as the enemy. What we're after is a different way of doing politics. So that's what this slide is about. I've asked some questions at the end. We actually have to have democracy because the only alternative is might. Might, might makes right. I maybe shouldn't have written that. It's too hard to say. <laughs> um, that, those are the choices we have because we have to make collective choices. So how do you do it? You give lots of power to a small group, concentrate power, or you have a democratic approach. I think in this room, we probably want a democratic approach. Is it about winners or losers? I have just argued no, and I've also argued it's not just about majority rule. Majority rule, when you have to, but you also have to have, to have respect for human rights, and you have to have a considerable effort to develop consensus. Because if you don't, people get pissed off. If you happen to be on the losing end of a vote, you get peeved. Let's go to the next slide. So I like to have fun with this one. Here's an idea of what our winner-loser model of democracy looks like. Imagine a pizza party. You might have seen our little video. We have a pizza video. You have 10 people, and you're trying to decide what kind of pizza to order, so you put it to a vote. And four people vote for pepperoni, and three people vote for vegetarian, three people vote for double cheese. And somebody says, well, pepperoni wins, let's order pepperoni. And of course, people who voted double cheese or vegetarians say, well, wait a minute, what about my vote? Didn't it count for anything? Is that meaningless? You got 60% of people don't want pepperoni, you're just gonna order pepperoni. That's what the winner take all model does. It gives us pepperoni if pepperoni got 40% of the vote. Now there's something wrong with that. And people don't realize it doesn't have to be that way. And in this case, it's very obvious. You just order different kinds of pizza. It's not that complicated, right? So you order 40% pepperoni, 30% vegetarian, and 30% double cheese. 
Not a big deal, but you have to order more than one kind of pizza. Now, let's look at our model of democracy. Next slide. Oops, what's happening here? Oh, yeah, I, I turned the page too soon. Okay, so how do we elect our government in Canada? Well, we basically have 338 pizza parties. <laughs> right? We choose one winner, winner take all, in every riding. Now, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to end up with a lot of pepperoni, because pepperoni is kind of everybody's favorite, right? If 40% of the population in every riding likes pepperoni, we're going to have 100% pepperoni seats. No opposition, that's it. Too bad for vegetarians and, and double cheese. So that's how you understand how our system works, OK? So what's happening here is that, first of all, you're not representing everybody at the individual riding level. You're only representing 40% of people. And then as you multiply that, because you keep having the same result in every riding, you end up with 100% pepperoni. So that aggregation problem is very, very serious. And it is that aggregation problem that means that first past the post systematically, all the time, favors the winning party. Okay, in this case, it's pepperoni. Pepperoni ends up with 100% of the seats rather than 40%. 40% might be okay, but they end up with 100%. In, uh, when we have regular elections, well, we don't get 100% liberals or 100% conservatives, but we get 54, 60% with 40% of the vote. That's the pepperoni vote. Wins a majority government. And as it turns out, in our system, that means 100% of the power. Now, okay, so 100% is an overstatement. I accept that. But it's a lot of power. Basic. I mean, look at Doug Ford. He's basically does what, does what he wants, right? So did Justin Trudeau. So did Stephen Harper. For four years, a party elected with 39.5% of the vote gets to do whatever it wants. I find that kind of concentration of power really, really, really scary. And Trudeau said, well, it's not as scary when it's me. OK. <laughs> no, he said that. People don't care so much about proportional representation now that I've been elected. OK, well, if the planet's going to hell in a handbasket, I'm still scared, even if it's Trudeau. But I'm even more scared when it's Doug Ford or Donald Trump or Boris Johnson. Absolutely. I concede that. But it's still scary, right? And some of the scariest stories in the world today are due to false majorities. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later on. So that's this slide. It's all about concentration of power. And it's concentration of power because the parties that are leading get more than their share. And the smaller parties, the ones that are probably very important to people in this room, the NDP and the Greens, they get less than their share, systematically, every election. Okay? So this is not representative. So problems with this system, first point, parliament's not representative. That's obvious. False majorities, I've talked about it. Regional strongholds, now that is a really fun one. Right now, federally, the liberals have 100% of the seats in Atlantic Canada. So there's your pepperoni. We got 100% pepperoni in Atlantic Canada. Now that's really problematic. Um, because there are conservative voices in those regions. There are NDP voices. They are not represented at all. Where's the Atlantic NDP voice in Parliament? There isn't any. Okay? More seriously, perhaps, in some respects, is the liberals are hardly represented at all in Saskatchewan and Alberta and Manitoba. So where are the conservative and NDP voices even in, um, in government at all? There, there are no liberal voices from those provinces in government. And Trudeau had that problem, not Justin Trudeau, but Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He had no representatives in the West. He tried to make a deal with broadband, it fell apart, but at least he was aware that that was a problem. Stéphane Dion, who was a, a great proponent of proportional representation within the Liberal Party, he flagged that as the most serious problem. It divides our country, it overemphasizes regional differences relative to where they are. A rigid two-party system and alternance of power. Uh, Joel talked about Coke and Pepsi, I think, as being our two choices. Well, we have the conservatives and the liberals. Yes, we don't have any choice. We go back and forth. We elect one group. We leave them in for a couple of, a couple of turns. We get tired of them, turf them out, try something else. And that's the way it goes, back and forth, you know, two or three terms per party. Um, we have, because the vote is so sensitive to small shifts, you can have 35% of the vote and you're in opposition, you get 39% of the vote, you have a majority government. 
4% of the vote makes all the difference. Well, is it surprising that parties are fighting tooth and nail all the time? This is a winner-take-all system, and it's winner-take-all fighting. Policy lurch, that's you have a carbon tax, Andrew Scheer wins, out goes the carbon tax. We get a lot of that with first past the post. That's a serious problem. And I've left for last the serious, serious problem of fairness, equity, civil rights, the question about voters that elect no one. That's what we mean when we say a wasted vote. And you can only understand a wasted vote if you understand proportional representation. Because everybody says, well, yeah, my vote didn't count. I lost. OK, that's the name of the game. That's the way it goes. So people, they've reconciled themselves with this winner-take-all model. But then when you say to them, well, it doesn't have to be like that. Just like I did with my pizza example. It doesn't have to be like that, that you know, just because you didn't vote pepperoni, you lost. With a proportional system, every vote, you know, within bounds, because you, you, know, you can vote for some party that wins nothing. OK, fine. But within bounds, every vote actually serves to elect somebody. If I vote NDP, I vote Green, that vote counts to elect somebody from that party. So that's the, you have to understand proportional representation before you can understand this notion about wasted votes. But once you understand it, that is a really, really powerful argument because so many of our votes are wasted. I live in Ottawa Vanier. Everybody wastes their vote in Ottawa Vanier because we know who's going to win ahead of time. It's going to be a liberal. So even if you vote liberal, you're wasting your vote. You might as well not vote, right? But if you live in a swing riding, and you know, the two main contenders are, let's say, uh, conservative and NDP, then OK, then if you vote conservative or NDP, your vote's actually quite powerful. So that, those are the votes that actually count. It's a very, very small minority of the total vote that actually counts for anything. So you've got this huge inequality in voter empowerment under first past the post. So to try to understand what the difference is now, and I've already uh, set the ground for it, and go to the next slide. Here's what you need to know to understand what the difference is between a non-proportional system and a proportional system. It's actually not that complicated. Um, but first of all, what's non-proportional? Well, first past the post. That's what we've got. So that means in a riding, whichever candidate has the most votes wins. That first past the post. That's what that means. Uh, runoff is where you have two rounds. So if you haven't got a majority with the uh, first vote, then you can have a second round to make sure that whoever gets elected has a majority. But you're still electing just one. And with uh, alternative vote, which is the system that Justin Trudeau seems to like, it's the same thing. You keep the single member ridings, but you still elect just one. So you still have winners and losers. Okay? So those are the different aspects of what I like to call non-proportional systems. That's what they are. Some people call them majoritarian because they tend to create false majorities. But I mean, that's kind of like confusing, right? So non-proportional, I think, is the best way to describe that. So it's winners and losers. Uh, most often, it yields a majority government in terms of seats. And the basis of it is one member per riding. That's the key. That's what makes it a majoritarian, what's called majoritarian or a non-proportional system. So what changes? when you go to a proportional system is you don't elect just one MP at a time. You find a way of electing five or six or ten or the whole country at one time. In small countries, they elect, like in the Netherlands or, or Israel, they just have the one list right across the country. So you vote for a party, and whatever share of the vote the party gets, that's the share of seats that they get. That's, that's when you do the whole country. But a lot of countries have got regional systems, which is what we're, and basically anybody proposes for a big country like Canada. You couldn't do the whole country for all kinds of different reasons. But you have to have some formula for grouping ridings. Right? So either you have multi-member ridings in the first place, or with the mixed member model, you've got single member ridings, but then you've got top-ups. And the top-ups are done on a group, on a regional basis. Right? So it's that regional basis, more than one MP at a time, that makes for proportionality. With just single member ridings, it is impossible. Uh, save some fancy formulations, which I don't want to go into, that get very complicated. Let's look at the next slide. You're going to see here who's got first past the post and who has other forms of, um, of voting. 
You can see most of the world in terms of geographical surface area uh, uses other uh, things than first past the post. What you've got in terms of the OECD countries is basically the UK, the US, and Canada, those three countries. We know very well about those. But you've also got India over there, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So you've got some, a large part of the world's population is still under uh, first past the post. As you probably know, those countries, India, Bangladesh and, and Pakistan have got problems of their own with their democracies, uh, particularly uh, India and, and Pakistan, I would say. And then in Africa, you've got a large number of countries that are former, mainly former British colonies that simply absorbed that system. Um, the exception there is South Africa, which when it came out of apartheid, um, changed towards a proportional representation system because they wanted to bring, uh, Mandela wanted to bring people together. You don't bring people together with first past the post, that just divides people, right? So they were able to get that, tra that transition. Australia is not marked there. It's got first, uh, first past the post kind of system, AV, uh, for parliament, and they've got proportional representation for, for the Senate. So you can see the rest of the world basically, in, in the OECD countries, 80% of OECD countries have proportional representation right now. The next slide talks about democracy in the world today. I worry a lot about democracy in the world today, but it's not just me, everybody's worried about it. But look around and ask yourselves where the problems are most serious. Okay, Donald Trump, Doug Ford, Brexit, false majorities, concentration of power. Those are all first past the post countries. Okay, but what about those proportional representation countries like Poland and Hungary? Well, as it turns out, when you look more closely, they're proportional, but they have this huge majoritarian top up or other formulas to make it majoritarian. So countries like Hungary right now have lost a lot of their democratic bona fides, partly because they got false majorities. The same thing holds in Poland and Greece as well. So it's the false majorities that are a problem. When you get a false majorities, people can then game the system going down the line. Just like the Republicans in the US have got all this gerrymandering stuff, right? You give them the power, they use it, they abuse it, and they change the system to make it always in their favor. So that's what's happening, and the problem's the same. False majorities, concentration of power. Wherever you look, if you've got serious problems with, and Turkey, Wherever you look, you've got serious problems with the democracy, it's because power is being too concentrated. It's not because of proportional representation. Proportional representation helps avoid the excess concentration of power. I'll say just a, next slide, just a quick comment about preferential ballots, but I think I already have. Uh, so this is uh, Justin Trudeau's favorite system. Come on, let's be frank. He likes this system because it would benefit the, the Liberal Party. And, and that's why he couldn't act on it either, because it was so transparent. And none of the experts, I mean, something like 4% of the experts weighed in favor of, of ranked ballots as a solution. Mainly, it's not a solution because it is still a winner-take-all. It doesn't solve all those other problems that we've talked about. It does solve some things. It means that you don't have to vote strategically quite the same way. It means the votes won't split quite the same way. We don't really know what it would give because the only country that has it is Australia, basically. So it's not something that there's been a lot of experimentation with. But I worry about it a lot, and fair vote Canada worries about it a lot, because we fear that it would further concentrate power in two parties, the conservatives and liberals, more, more likely than not, and lock us in. It's not like some people say, well, rank balance, let's do that first, and then once people get used to having some change, we'll have more change. Well, I worry about that because it could lock us in, because the power structure would be such that neither of the two parties that have power would want it. And in Australia, of course, it hasn't changed. It's locked in. So we are very much against it for that reason, despite the fact that it has some advantages. And it's great for e electing leaders. Uh, it's great. Whenever you have one position, like a mayor, this is a good way to go. But when you're trying to elect a legislature, not such a good idea. All right, now we're going to go to the how-to. You're going to see how fast this goes. This is what you need to know about what Proportional representation would mean for you. Here's how you would vote. With single transferable vote, you get to rank your candidates. So you choose the candidates you like, one, two, three, four, five. You've got multi-member ridings. In this case, I think it's a, a riding of five. So you might want to vote for one, two, three, four, five and stop there, but you could keep going, doesn't matter. The nice thing about single transferable vote, you can actually vote across parties. Your favorite might be a liberal, and your second might be a green, and so on. So this is the 
system that gives voters the most choice of all. It's probably the most democratic. Uh, but when the ridings get really big, like if you have 10 or something like that, you have a lot of choice, but it can be a bit of a burden for uh, voters to know what to do. So that's fine. It's, that's what BC uh, put forward. I think it's a good system. And the next one, this is what it looks like with mixed member proportional with two, two votes. So the first one is you'd vote for your local candidate. And the second one, you vote for the party you want. So you have to choose within the party. And you choose the candidate that you want from that party. So you have two X's rather than one. It could be done different ways, but this is one way to do it. This is very simple for the voter. Designing electoral systems is complex, and it can give you a headache. But that's not something we as voters need to worry about. This is what we need to worry about. How are we going to vote? Do we like this or do we not? And we care about the results, right? That's what we should be talking about. And that's why I'm not focusing on all the details about how the results are counted and all the rest of it. You need to know what the ballot looks like, and that's it. So let's go into the next section. So I've titled this section, Better Democracy for All. I think electoral reform is really important. I'm retired. I could be sitting on a beach. I could be playing squash, having a good time. <laughs> I do this seven days a week for nothing. I'm, I'm a volunteer, 100%. Why? Well, because I, think I care about this. I think this really matters. If you change our democracy, you basically change everything else. And I'm going to be giving you some examples of that. It's about power. It's about voter empowerment. Um, why does it matter? End to policy lurch. New type of political discourse. Now, then I get into policy. Better environmental policy. Sound economic policy. Greater social eco economic equality. Now, I haven't talked about that yet. And I'm not going to very much. But I will say this. The research shows that these kinds of policies and virtually any other kind of policy, you get better policy, better policy discourse when you have proportional representation. And I think I've got a little slide yeah, next door here. The next slide here. I'm, obviously, I'm not going to talk to this. But this is taken from our review of research on proportional representation. And each petal talks about one of the things that is simply better with proportional representation. And ultimately, it's because you're more accountable to voters when voters actually are empowered. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, it works. It actually works. And when you don't have false majority governments so that parties that are the ones forming government, they, they're doing so with a minority, they have to be in coalition with others or they have to discuss with others. When you do that, you get into more depth and the policies tend to last. So you avoid that policy lurch. And in the long run, you get better policy. Environmental policy, in particular, is much stronger in European countries than it is in Canada or the United States, I believe, for this reason, that they've got proportional representation. So next slide. What's the problem? This is the problem. Vested interests. And it is a really, really big problem. And that's what has stopped us all these decades. That's what stopped the Electoral Reform Society for 100 years from getting it in the UK Parliament. And we like to put politicians at the top because it's so obvious. Politicians get elected. They form a false majority government under the current system. And then, so then you say, but you know, it's not really a very good system. You should change it. And sometimes you get enlightened leaders, René Lévesque in Quebec, for example who truly believe that you need to fix our electoral system. But what happens? So first of all, that doesn't always happen. And they often change their minds as well. Um, I wouldn't say Trudeau changed his mind. I think he was just being hypocritical from the start. Uh, but some others have changed their mind. The CAC in Quebec right now is kind of getting cold feet. But if you look at the CAC in Quebec right now, it's a perfect example. This has happened in three times in Quebec, under René Lévesque, under Charest, and now it's happening under the CAC. They lose their caucus. Okay, so you've elected 55, 60% of the, you filled 55, 66% of the seats from one party, in this case, with 37% of the vote. That leaves a lot of CAC MNAs who are going to lose their seats if you bring in proportional representation. And it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I won't get into the details. But I did the calculations, and there are 76 CAC. MNAs right now in Quebec, 27 of them, if you had exactly the same vote, 27 of them would have lost their seat every single time. So we cannot trust the politicians. And that includes the NDP. 
at least don't trust them 100%. I trust them more federally than provincially because provincially they've never done it. They've been in power in New Brunswick, in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, in Alberta, in BC, in Ontario. They have never brought in proportional representation <laughs> when they had the chance. Okay? So that may have changed and, you know, we don't want to tar everybody with, with we don't want to tar everybody with a tar brush. I'm mixing my metaphors here. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing, losing track of my own thoughts. Um, so, and it's not just politicians, it's also voters. As soon as voters themselves see politics in terms of winners and losers, they're going to start thinking, well, you know, proportional representation, that's for losers. I'm a winner. I vote liberal. I vote conservative. You know? So you give a referendum and, well, maybe they're going to vote against proportional representation, as has happened many times. I think that's a consideration. It's just worth, worth putting in there. It's not all voters that are real Democrats. My brother, my brother was against proportional representation because it would elect NDPers. <laughs> He's a small businessman and gets kind of conservative, I guess, right? And I'm like, Julian, this is, you know, this isn't very democratic of you. <laughs> and then there's the mainstream media and corporate lobbyists. The fact is, corporate lobbyists have way more power under first past the post because they only have to deal with one party. Imagine if they have to start dealing with three parties. It gets way more complicated. Um, and the mainstream media, well, it tends to be very conservative. And um, I'll, I'll, give you some, uh, I'll give you an image about that in a second, but let me just finish here. Um, I, I just want to say referendums, we have to be very clear about referendums. What referendums are, who advocates for referendums is people who oppose proportional representation. And they, oppose, they call for referendums to defeat proportional representation. Let's be really clear, that is what's happening. And we have to be very, very careful not to be manipulated by this notion that, oh, but it's, demo it's democratic. It's democratic, it's also an opportunity to be manipulated. And we've seen it in, in BC, it was disgusting what happened in BC. People like me, we dedicated a year and a half of our lives to winning that, that referendum. Right till the last minute, it looked like we were going to win. And we lost, and we lost badly, 60-40 based on fear-mongering, misinformation, and to some extent mismanagement by the NDP. All of these things, but that's another story. But the odds are definitely against us, and we need to find a better solution for how to consult with people. Now, here's a little slide that I like to use. This is the mainstream media and who they elected, who, who they endorsed between 2006 and 2015, and the blue, I don't have to tell you, is conservative. The mainstream media is highly conservative in this country, and they are opposed to proportional representation for all of the, rest, the reasons that vested interests are opposed to empowering the voters. So when you're fighting the mainstream media, it gives opponents of the yes side in a referendum an incredible tool. These people can advertise as much as they want, and it's not called advertising. It's just a story on what the liberal MLA had to say about proportional representation, word for word. I tell you, what, the, what we had to fight in, in BC referendum, it was really, really tough, and it was very disheartening. OK, so reclaim my next slide. Reclaiming democratic power, then. Can we do it? And where do we stand today? So first of all, growing awareness not just in your movement, but I think in the general population, more and more people are aware of this. And to some extent, we have to thank Justin Trudeau for that. My colleagues don't like it when I thank Justin Trudeau for anything. But look, what did he say? He said, our voting system is broken. He may not have used those words, but he said it. That's pretty powerful. First time, I think, that a, a prime minister says that. And then he organized one of the biggest consulta he, not, but the government organized one of the biggest consultations in the history of this country. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved. So we got more publicity for proportional representation in 2016 than I think we'd ever had. So we do have this, this growing awareness. We also have new issues like climate change, which brings this to the fore, because we're not going to get action on climate change if we keep going from Coke to Pepsi and having Pepsi undo what Coke did. We need something that lasts. 
And so there's a strong argument for proportional representation there. These new issues, today's issues, require consensus. We don't, we can no longer function on the basis of winners and losers and giving all the power to, to one country, to one uh, party to do what it wants. The argument about citizens' power versus vested interest has to be said, and it has to be said in those terms. Fairvote Canada has shied away from that in the past. I think we don't do that anymore. We need to talk about it. That's the expression we can use, vested interests. That's what they are. We have new tools like citizens' assemblies. I can talk a lot about citizens' assembly, but if we're going to diss referendums as being something that's too easily manipulated, we have to have something in its place. We can't just hand it over to the politicians. That's not going to work any better. It has to be citizens. A citizens' assembly is a different formula for hearing from citizens. What you do, you select a representative group of ordinary citizens, not experts, ordinary citizens. It's a structured, random sample. But you give them resources, you give them time, you give them the opportunity to conduct their own public consultations, and you give them access to expertise. You give them time to deliberate. A citizen's assembly is a deliberative form of citizen involvement, and that's the key. When people can deliberate, they talk amongst themselves, they try to come to a consensus, and then they come to consensus recommendations, I guarantee you they're going to recommend proportional representation. That's very different from a referendum because the lobbyists will not have the same opportunity to scaremonger and provide misinformation when citizens have enough time to digest the information. Now, there is a challenge. Is that legitimate enough? Maybe not. You have to have some mechanism that complements it, and I'm working on this for Fair Vote Canada, some mechanism that harnesses enough public consultation that when the Citizens' Assembly makes its recommendations, it's solid. You can't, unattackable in terms of legitimacy. It's got to be unattackable. And then, so that's one of the things we're fighting for. We think if we can get a minority liberal government coming forward, conservatives, I, well, they won't even be able to rule if they have a minority. If we have a majority, we're done, at least for a while. Okay? We're not going to get anything. But a liberal minority, that's what we're fighting for. Then the Greens, the NDP, and the Bloc are going to have the balance of power, and they can use that to get proportional representation. I mentioned the Bloc because the Bloc also is favorable to proportional representation. The only thing is they're also favorable to a referendum, so there's some education. There's some education to, to be done there. So I'm going to skip ahead because I think I'm probably uh, going over time, so I need to be careful. So now I want to talk a little bit about Fair Vote Canada's strategy. So we've lost a lot of battles. And we get discouraged, and our supporters get discouraged. But I want you to be aware that we're fighting on many fronts. And if we lose one front, we just shift over. It's kind of like a guerrilla war, you know. Uh, and we currently have fronts, Quebec. Uh, they've legislated something right now, but they're calling for referendums. I find it very scary, but we're working on that. Uh, the proposition that's in the legislation isn't very good. It needs to be improved, going with, to a referendum with a lousy uh, proposal is just a recipe for, for deceit, defeat, so we need to work on that, work with the opposition. PEI, we had a referendum, it lost narrowly, uh, but it, it's not binding on anybody. It wasn't binding on the yes side, wasn't binding on the no side. We're proposing a citizens' assembly to get things moving again. The leader of the Conservative Party in PEI is pro-PR, so that helps. Uh, Ontario, has the case ever been clearer for why we need proportional representation than in Ontario? It is so clear that even the Liberals may see the light of day. <laughs> so I'm going to be working primarily with the Liberals, hope, trying to bring them to the table. Uh, the NDP, in the, in the meantime, has named Peggy Sattler as their Democratic reform critic. This is a senior person in the NDP. So we're going to have a senior person in the NDP. And on the Liberal side, we still don't know. It depends who ends up getting elected leader, but hopefully I've been working with Nathalie Desrosiers. I don't know if you know Nathalie Desrosiers, but she's, a, she's been a fan of proportional representation for, for decades. Um, so we're hoping if, if the leader is somebody who's a fan that that will help. So we'll work with the Liberals, the NDP, and the Greens uh, after the federal election, depending how it goes. And maybe we have to wait till the, the Liberals have elected somebody. But then the idea is, like they did in Quebec, to come to the election in 2022 with a cross-party agreement ahead of time. Not after you've gotten your false majority, before. We kind of thought we had 
uh, the cack by the balls there, but uh, it's, they're slippery. <laughs> they're slippery. So New Brunswick, Yukon's got a commission going right now. New Brunswick's got a wrong winner government right now, all kinds of reasons, and the Greens have quite a bit of, of influence there, but I don't know what's possible. We have a charter challenge on the go. Uh, this is not us, it's Fair Voting BC and Springtide, but it's happening. Uh, listen, if proportional representation is about civic rights, you'd think that there'd be a case to be made in terms of the charter. Uh, I don't know if we'll win, because don't forget the courts are political too, um, but uh, we're going to try. Citizens' assemblies, this is really big. This is something we have now adopted as a formal part of our strategy, and it will be so in the future. Why it's so important is that if we do have a liberal minority, there's no way that the Greens and the NDP will be able to say to the Liberals, okay, you put in PR or we're not supporting you. The Liberals will just call their bluff, right? Yeah, let's just have another election or whatever. But imagine the Liberals saying, no, we won't have a citizens' assembly. We don't want to hear from citizens. They can't do that, right? They're going to have to say yes. So it's the easy ask, but the easy ask is going to have something attached to it, which is you don't just have a citizens' assembly and then ignore it. You have to promise to act on those recommendations. Then we will support you. So let's just see how that goes. But that's, uh, that's the strategy we have developed in consultation with the NDP and the Greens. Um, to some extent, the Bloc, but not so much because we haven't had as much opportunity. So yeah, so going into 2019, uh, what we're trying to do is to elect more pro-PR MPs. We've, if you go to our website, you'll see we're focusing on 21 strategic ridings across the country. And these are all ridings where you're pitting a non-PR candidate, a liberal or a conservative usually, against a PR candidate, a leading Green or a leading NDP. And we're pushing really hard. We're using all the resources we have. It's not a lot. Uh, I would say one of the ridings where we're pushing the hardest is Ottawa Centre, the one we're in right now. Um, and what we're doing as Fair Vote Canada is we're circulating this little door hanger. Well, we're circulating a lot of this little door hanger. We're aiming for almost 30,000 copies. We have 50 volunteers. Uh, and what's nice about it, it does stand out. You know, it's hard to find this on your doorknob and, and not look at it at all. So on the front, you've got why proportional representation, sort of all the key arguments. And on the back, it says, many of us were inspired by Trudeau's promise to make 2015 the last first-past-the-post election. We were betrayed. Let's elect an MP we can trust to put electoral reform back on the agenda in October. Fairville Canada endorses the NDP's Emily Tamman and the Green Party's Angela Keller Herzog. Join us in supporting these Ottawa Centre candidates. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and we have some advertising as well, uh, but this is a really big push. Now, it's not easy. We're trying to defeat a cabinet minister here, right? Catherine McKenna is a cabinet minister. Uh, but Joel Harden defeated a cabinet minister, so if he can do it, maybe we can do it too, and, and we're really trying hard. Uh, this is the biggest effort we have ever made in, uh, in a single riding. Now, I'm just going to close uh, with my last slide, which is what you can do. Okay, now listen, this is a citizen's movement. It only works if citizens get engaged, and that's where you come in. And there's different ways. There's easy ways, harder ways. You can develop your own understanding. Go on our website. There's all kinds of really cool stuff. You can sign up. You, there's a petition on there called the Declaration of Voters' Rights. Sign up, then you get our emails, which of course will invite you to volunteer for this, that, and the other thing, and to donate. But we don't really, we don't exaggerate. You know, you, on average, you might get about one email a month. So I would encourage you to do that. If this is an issue that interests you, we need to grow our list. Help us do that. Of course, you, you, you can vote. Uh, find out who's your pro-PR candidate in your riding. Vote for them. And get others to vote for them as well. Um, support in other ways, like donating to their campaigns. Help to make PR an electoral issue by asking questions at all candidates' debates, for example. I did that here in, uh, last night at the debate that they had, or, or, or uh, Wednesday night, I think it was, actually. Thursday. Um, Ask at the door when they come. And if you want to help with this, oh, donate to Fair Road Canada would be nice. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to close with this one. If you want to help with this, we're actually going after my talk, we're going to go do a couple of maps. And I have a colleague here. Are you here, Alec, uh, Ty? Is he here? Yeah, so Ty and I over here, we're going to go. We have two maps, and we have the door hangers to go with those two maps. If you want to go for a walk with us for about an hour and a half, we're going to try to get those two maps done. 
Can I have a show of hands who might be interested in that, just so I know where we stand? Is there anybody who might be interested? No. OK, well, that, that makes things a lot easier. If you change your mind, come and see one of us. Stand up, Ty. Just come and see one of us you know, shortly after our talk. Otherwise, we will go alone. And instead of doing two maps, we'll do just one. So I, I know you probably in you know, this last minute, so, but I, I wanted to at least give you that opportunity. That's how I see it when it comes to volunteering for Fair Vote Canada. It's an opportunity. So I probably talked too long, but I did what I could. Do we have time for questions at all? Or did I use yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, we have time for a, a few questions. Do, yeah. do, do, do I do that? Yeah, you do that. Please. Okay, well, why don't we start with you? So the question is the following. If a prime minister agrees that democracy is broken, but not specifically pro-PR, as in yeah. our current prime minister, how do you convert an existing or aspiring MP to be pro-PR without their being seen by their party to be not towing the party line? Because we see the... Yes, and, and your, your question is, is very acute. Um, we, we lost a lot of our liberal MPs after the broken promise. We lost our friends. They, some of them were still willing to talk to us, but they had to toe the party line. Some of them less so than others. Those are the ones we're endorsing on our, on our site. Uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould is one of those, and we're going to try to help elect her. Uh, she's always been a supporter. Nathaniel, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith is another who has not towed the party line, but most of others have. Um, we, g we gave up on trying to bring liberals over until after the next election. After the next election, we're not even optimistic that it would be possible to get them to implement PR, even if the NDP and the Greens are holding a balance of power. Hence, the strategy, let's have a citizens' assembly. The idea with the Citizens' Assembly is that it will give greater legitimacy than ever to the notion that what citizens want is proportional representation, assuming that's what the Citizens' Assembly comes up with, but they always have, so I'm, faith, I'm confident that they will. So basically, we have to change the legitimacy game so that proportional representation is seen as the only legitimate option from the perspective of citizens. And I do know that from talking with liberal MPs that they do want to bring this issue back, but they also feel that it was dead until, 2020, until this election 2019. So we do have some allies. We'll continue to work with them and, and try to find solutions. But this is the one we're pushing for. We've been talking to a lot of liberal MPs about a citizens' assembly. Most of them, at first, they don't quite get it. Once they get it, they say, yeah, this is what we need. So I think we'll be able to sell this idea. All right. Um, so let me go with this gentleman here, and, and then I'll go back there. I noticed on your website, I took a quick look, that you are endorsing People's Party candidates. So this is very democratic of you. But I wonder, are you concerned about a political hit for that? About? A political hit for approval. Are you going to take a political hit for that? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of our supporters don't like it at all. Um, and I don't like it. It wasn't actually my decision. I'll say that. Um, however, it, 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 the idea, I know, I know the idea behind it. We have to show that we're not NDP cronies, that we're nonpartisan and will support anybody that supports proportional representation. So that's why we're also supporting Jody Wilson-Raybould and some liberals. We couldn't find any conservatives to support, but we did find. So Sabil Trim, who's one of them, is someone I know very well. She interviewed me and, and spent like an hour and made a video. Uh, so she's been a Fairville Canada partisan for years. So those are the people we endorse on a personal basis. And yes, we are taking a little bit of a hit, but I think people understand, like, like you're being very understanding as well. And the lady in the back? Well, I just wanted to get your thoughts about uh, deploying your vote at the ballot box. <coughs> Scratching? Scratching. Spoiling your ballot box. Spoiling your ballot box. You're assuming that you're going to waste your vote anyway, so why, why not just waste it? Well, I mean, it's a whole democratic process, so but don't they have to indicate that you've declined your vote? Like, that has to be noted somewhere, and then that gets... You're talking about in the new law, not in the current law, right? No, I'm talking about... Yeah, as a protest vote? Yeah. I, I don't particularly recommend that because it's so easy to waste your vote by voting for one of the smaller parties anyway. You know, just do that. Yeah, you can vote for there's a none of, none of the above party that is a protest vote, if you wanted to send a message that way. Because there's only since the 
the last election that they started tracking those. <laughs> but I don't think they can. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it's going to have much influence. Well, all right. Thank you, Riel. My pleasure. Riel, for your time and effort, please accept this gift on behalf of the CCU. Thank you, Thank you very much again. Thank you. Keep up the good work, and I hope you.